algorithm that uh, so new hasn't even been published. In fact, it's in review as we speak. It's David's work, and uh, it's pretty cool stuff. But to get to it, I need to um, describe for you where we are with regard to the problem of learning and the state estimation framework that I've been describing. So we described the problem of learning from a common filter perspective. We said that the objective of the learner is to estimate the state of the environment. In his mind, he has a generative model in which he describes how the data that he's collecting is generated. Based on that generative model, he estimates, he or she estimates the parameter that makes up the hidden state of that, of that environment. And then we talked about how using the hidden state approach where we estimate the hidden state, we can take observations and compare it to predictions and then compute a change in our belief about the hidden state of the system. Now, let me begin by giving you a brief review of what we would predict regarding what uh, the learner should do in a situation where noises are altered and state estimation says how he should learn more or learn less from a particular prediction error. So in a scenario where, this is, this is going to be chapter 7 by the way, the material today will be chapter 7. The material that I'm going to be describing with regard to this new work, David's work, is not in anything, so it's not in the book, it's not in any published work, you're just going to have to listen to me and pay attention to it and write it down. You're going to have a homework based on that, that David just put up on the website tonight. So um, we'll give you an opportunity to, to think about it. All right, so suppose that we have the state, state estimation problem. We have x hat of trial n is equal to a x hat, um, sorry, x of trial n minus 1. plus some uh, uh, state update noise epsilon x, which we're going to have um, as variance uh, uh, sigma squared x with mean 0. And we have an observation y of n, say it's equal to x of n plus epsilon y, where epsilon y is normal 0 sigma squared y, that's variance. Now, when we describe the problem of learning here, we say that, well, we're going to have some belief about x hat at trial n given n. So this is our posterior belief. And that depends on our prior belief, x hat of n, n minus 1, plus this thing that we call the common gain, the relationship between our uncertainties in our beliefs and our uncertainty in our observation, times the difference between what we observed and what we predicted. And we wrote that in the case of a scalar system like this, the common gain is going to be equal to the ratio between my prior uncertainty and my um, observation uncertainty, which in this case is going to be just p of n and minus 1 plus sigma squared y. So if you look at this equation, k of n is really what we might say is my sensitivity to error. tells me how much am I going to learn from error. So if I make a prediction and I don't observe what I thought I should observe, I'm going to learn something about my prediction and I'm going to improve my belief. But how much I learn from that error is this gain, which we've been calling the common gain, the sensitivity to error. And today's lecture is about this gain, k. And I'm going to show you that our theories associated with the state estimation only takes us so far. When we begin to look at how biological systems learn, humans learn, we're going to see that it begins to fail. And we're going to need something else. And we're going to come up with a different way of thinking about things. But the, the state of the art is more or less here, that there is an objective way to modulate your sensitivity to error, and that has to do with the common gain. And what is this common gain? It's the relationship between your prior belief that has uncertainty in it, P, and your observation. So in 2008, people began to test this theory to see if indeed in biological systems their sensitivity to error was modulated by the relationship between their uncertainty about what they believed and the uncertainty about what they observed. So just to give you a, a sense of what that means, just a stepping back. Basically, if I'm uncertain about my prediction, I'm going to say tomorrow it's going to rain. But it turns out that I'm a pretty bad predictor. I don't really have a whole lot of confidence in my prediction. 
So therefore, if tomorrow comes and it's sunny, I'm going to change my predictions. I'm going to learn something from my error, and I'm going to learn a lot, because I was very uncertain about my prediction. On the other hand, if I'm pretty darn certain about it, if I'm you know, George Bush, and I made prediction that there's going to be weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, by God, there's going to be those things. And I'm going to be pretty darn hard pressed to believe that there isn't, because I'm pretty certain about my belief. So I don't mean to say anything wrong about George Bush. He's a fine president. Only that he was pretty certain about his predictions. And of course, you have to be in these scenarios. OK, so in 2008, people began using these kinds of formulations to ask whether the way individuals learned from error could be thought about in the framework of uncertainty, meaning that does the uncertainty of the learner have something to do with the way they learn? OK, so the easy way to manipulate things is down here with regard to sigma squared y. Right? So if I make it so that your observations are associated with a lot of noise, then what you should do is to not learn. Right? Because the denominator here becomes large, and so that means that k should become small. So the easy thing to do is to make it so that the learner, when they observe stimuli, when they observe the consequences, they just make it so that it's very noisy. So their sensors are bad. So that makes it so that you know I'm not going to learn very much from my errors. So um, just to be concrete about things, suppose that we, we look at k of n as a function of n, and you know, we know that k of n is going to converge to some value as you iterate, and this convergence is going to be dependent on these noises, the noises associated with my uncertainties and the noises associated with my observation. And so if I have a scenario where k squared y, uh, sigma squared y is, is 2, Whereas sigma squared x is 1, suppose that my uncertainty associated with this noise here, this, this noise in the, in, the, in the state equation is small, my observation noise is high, what's going to happen is that in this case, k is going to be pretty small. Whereas if I have the opposite scenario, where if I have my observation noise is, so here, I have sigma squared y is equal to 1, whereas sigma squared x is equal to 2, there my k is going to be larger. Because I'm uncertain about my predictions here. The state equation has more noise in it than the observation equation. So therefore, I'm going to be more receptive to my learning errors. I'm going to learn more from my errors. So if the state equation has noise that's large, that's going to make me uncertain about my predictions. If the observation equation has more noise, it's going to make me uncertain about my observations. Either of these two can change the common game. Any questions? OK. That's the theory. Rudolf Coleman, who is still alive, would say, that's obvious. So what the heck is new? Well, what was new is that people in the world of learning thought that, oh, well, that's really cool. Should we try it on people to see how they learn and see if they modulate their learning based on things like this? So they began doing experiments where they uh, tried to manipulate things like sigma squared y and sigma squared x. And so the first experiment that was, th that was done similar to this was in 2008. And the way they manipulated sigma squared y, the observation noise, is by having people make movements, but then giving them feedback that was like a blur. So suppose you're asked to move and hit a target, but I'm not going to show you your hand. What I'm going to show you is this like a blur that's supposed to represent your hand. And sometimes the blur is going to be tight. Sometimes it's going to be wide. So when it's tight, that gives you a small variance about what you're seeing. When it's wide, you're going to be very uncertain about what you're seeing. And what they saw was that, indeed, in scenarios where the feedback was blur, a wide blur, individuals didn't really learn much from their error. Whereas when the feedback was a, you know, a bright representation of their consequences of their action, they learned more from the error. So it seems pretty obvious, right, that that should happen. Now, is that because of the common gain? Well, we don't know. Maybe if you just give a, you know, sort of a cruddy feedback to people, they say, well, what? I don't know what's going on here. Why should I learn anything? But nevertheless, that was the first example of this scenario where 
um, by changing the feedback in terms of making it more noisy, individuals became less less uh, willing to learn um, from it. So, um, more interesting approach was. Th does that make sense? It just make the make the feedback more blurry. So it's effectively making it so that your sensory system is not very good. Like putting on glasses that you know fuzzify the environment around you. You're just not going to learn as much about the, uh, your errors as, as if you could see things clearly. Going back to the weapons of mass destruction thing, maybe he thought that their sensors weren't very good. They just couldn't find it. That's why he wasn't learning from error. Maybe it wasn't because of his priors. Maybe it was because his observation was noisy. Or he just didn't believe the people that reported the results to him. That could also be. One could make these judgments. OK. Um, all right. So let's suppose now we want to change the state, state noise here. Let me tell you about the experiment that was done along those lines. So again, these are movements that individuals are making. And what we have is that we have um, some state that depends on the previous one plus sigma x. And then we're going to have a perturbation. We're going to call it r. That's going to be equal to r0 plus the state x. And R is the perturbation. So there's a state X that depends, that, that, that alters my perturbation. And so in some cases, the, you know, the, we have a large amount of noise in the X. Sigma X is going to be large. In some other cases, the sigma X is going to have a small amount of noise. And um, on any given trial, The perturbation is going to change from trial to trial. And what, this, what the subject sees is where their hand went plus this perturbation um, plus some sensory noise sigma. So then you know, the, the objective is that you know, they're going to predict what the r is, r hat. They're going to have r hat, which depends on what they believe to x to be. And what they did in this experiment is that they manipulated the sigma x. And they considered two scenarios. They considered when sigma y was equal to 4, where sigma x was equal to 1, and another condition where sigma y was equal to 4, and sigma x was equal to, I think, 2 and a half or something like that. So what they did is that they tried to make the um, perturbation follow a stochastic change in, uh, in its value from trial to, to trial that depended on some noise, sigma x, and that was highly noisy in one condition. It changed a lot, whereas it was fairly persistent in another condition. And what they found was very small evidence for, um, for learning. So, so if this is trial number and this is error, on the first trial, the two groups have the same error. But what happens is that in this scenario, when sigma x is 1, presumably you would have an uncertainty here, the prior uncertainty, that would tend to have a smaller number than in this condition, here, when, it's, when, it's, uh, when sigma x is 2 and a half. And so in the condition where you're more uncertain, you should learn. So here's this, is this, this is this. Oh, sorry. No, I, I did it backwards. This is this. This is this. Because my uncertainty is higher. My prior uncertainty is going to be higher when sigma x is 2.5. So therefore, I'm going to learn more from error. My prior uncertainty is lower here, so I'm going to learn less from the error. My learning rate is going to be slower if my prior uncertainty p is smaller. If I'm, if I'm more certain about the dynamics of the stimulus, I'm going to learn less from my error than if I am less certain. So just to be clear, there was a small bit of evidence suggesting that if the dynamics of the perturbation are described by a state update equation that has large noise, the large noise implies more uncertainty about what's going to happen in my belief. P is going to be higher. That translates into a larger K, 
which translates into a larger sensitivity to air. And this turned out in that paper, it's the 2008 paper, it wasn't significant difference between these two lines, but it was in the right direction. Questions? Yeah. If um, sigma y was varying to, mm -hmm. um, would it, is it the ratio of sigma x to sigma y that? Um, yeah, it's more complicated, right? Because, um, so let, let's, let's remember what is the posterior uncertainty. So, so p of n plus 1 given n is equal to p of n given n times a squared plus sigma squared x. So you see a also is important here yeah. in, our, in our equation, right? But, but so is the sigma squared x. And then the squ sigma squared y comes into here. So the evolution of the prior uncer the, the, the uncertainty depends on sigma x. It's always being divided by this number that says add to it the sigma y. So it's the ratio of sigma y to the posterior uncertainty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good question. OK. Something about the slope. Yeah. Uh, so the current number and then the other yeah. is the error. Yeah. So if we begin with uh, higher uncertainty, uh -huh. Oh, because the error is unrelated to my uncertainty. It depends on my prediction, right? So it depends on the mean, not the variance. And so if, on average, these two groups are the same, of the, of have, you know, have the same mean in their prediction, which is that if I move, if I move like this, the cursor is going to go here, but it actually goes here, the error has the same mean. So it starts out basically error being equal to the perturbation. I generate this movement, I get this error. Now the question is, how much do I learn from that error? And the amount that I learn depends on my, how uncertain, how, how much do I believe this error that I see as compared to my own belief about what should happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So because error is controlled on the first trial by the environment, not by my uncertainty about the environment. So you know, I throw the ball, it doesn't matter how uncertain I was about I make a prediction about tomorrow's weather. What actually happens in tomorrow's weather is independent of my, right. So that I will just have some error. That depends on the, my prediction, the mean of my prediction, and the, and the actual observation. OK. All right. Um, so the, the next thing that was done along these lines was to try to see how um, people can manipulate uh, these, uh, these errors. And the, and the uncertainty to, and, and, the, and the decay, which is basically what, what, what uh, um, goes to our error sensitivity. And, and I want to just mention to you um, what, what worked and what really didn't work so well. So um, what didn't work very well were these attempts to make people better learners. So they could make people so they learned worse by adding noise to their observations. But they didn't really make them any better in their learning. So it was very hard to make the learner so that they learned more from the error than they would normally under reasonable circumstances. A couple of places where they succeeded were scenarios where basically they made it so that they thought they were making the person uncertain. And the way they did it were as follows. So a couple of things that was successful uh, in 2009 were as follows. So one of them was to have people sit in darkness before testing them. And the idea was as follows, that maybe my uncertainty matrix associated with the sensory consequences of my motor commands becomes large if I haven't been able to see the consequences of my motor command. So if you've made a prediction, but you don't know what happened, maybe you become more uncertain about your predictions. And so what they did is that they had people sit in uh, scenarios where, so, so say they're measuring k, this learning from error, and how much do you change your belief about the world as a function of uh, the error that you saw. And what they saw was that if you move with feedback, so suppose that there are three conditions. Move with normal feedback. And you know, you have some 
some value. This is how much I, how sensitive I am to error. Now, if I make it so that I move without feedback, so maybe I make you know, 100 movements and you never show me anything. Now, all of a sudden, you show me the result of one of them. What they found was that the person seems to learn a little bit more from that error. And if they made it so that you just sat silently in a room for like you know, a few minutes before you were tested, so you make no movements at all, don't move for a few minutes, and that made it increase as well. So it wasn't clear why these things were working. It wasn't clear. You know, why, why, why does it matter that the individual sits there for a while before they're allowed to make a movement? This process of waiting, does it, does it somehow make people uncertain? But it was interpreted in this framework that I've been telling you, that they're learning more from the error. It must be because they were made more uncertain about the prediction, and that resulted in the particular actions that you saw. Um, so the more systematic way to approach this problem was something that uh, puts aside the common filter approach and asks, in principle, what should a good learner do in a certain circumstances? And this has to do with the following. If your environment is one where it is changing rapidly from trial to trial, as compared to it is changing slowly from trial to trial, maybe it matters that that rate so maybe I should be able to do, you know, to, I would be able to perhaps do better if my world is somehow consistent and stable if I make predictions on that world. Whereas in a world that seems to be flipping and flopping from trial to trial, maybe in that kind of scenario it makes no sense for me to try to learn anything from error anyway. So in 2004, um, there was a student in my lab, his, his name is Murray Smith. He did a kind of a nifty experiment. He imagined a scenario like this that basically you have um, an environment and you know you make observations as before but what he did is that he manipulated this parameter a and the way he did it is uh, uh, based on uh, the following so if I, if I make an estimate now, if I say x hat of n given n is equal to x hat of n given n minus 1 plus k of n y of n minus y hat of n, then x, my, my prior on the next trial, x hat of n plus 1 given n is going to be a times x hat of n given n, which is equal to a times x hat of n n minus 1 plus a times k of n y of n minus y hat of n. So we see that a is a modulator of how much I learned from error. So if you look at my guess on the next trial and you compare it to my guess in the previous trial, you see that if I'm coming from a world where a is large, close to 1, I should learn more than if a is 0. So if a is 0, then x hat of n plus 1 given n is going to be equal to, has no relationship to anything in the past. That's going to be 0, its expected value. right? So I'm not going to learn anything from my error. If on the other hand, a is equal to 1, then my prior on trial n plus 1 is going to be x hat plus k of n times y minus y hat. So now in this case, the amount that I learned from error is going to be this. Whereas the amount that I learned from error, if a is equal to 0, not going to be, it's going to be nothing. So the idea was, if the perturbation is such that it's, it's, it's controlled by this parameter a. So and we're going to compare a perturbation that is generated by a random walk in which a is close to 1 versus when it's close to 0 versus where it's close to minus 1. And the idea is that in these three scenarios, the learner should behave differently. In case where a is e close to 1, we should see a lot of learning from error. In the case where a is equal to 0, we should see almost no learning from error. And if the case where a is equal to minus 1, if this theory is right, 
What should happen is that when they see an error to the right, instead of learning from that error by moving to the left, they should actually move further to the right because they expect A to be negative. So this was the basic idea. And let me show you what this means in terms of generating perturbations. So suppose that you want to generate a, a, a um, perturbation in which A is equal to 0.9. What does that mean? That means that the perturbation that you're giving is basically a signal that is, is a random walk and it moves slowly because the state on the next trial is highly correlated to the state in the previous trial. You can't jump very far. On the other hand, when A is equal to 0, what you have is basically you know, a random walk that looks like this. When A is equal to minus 0.9, almost minus 1, now you have even a higher frequency. It's flipping back and forth. And Maurice, what he did is that he had people sit in environments in which the distribution of the um, perturbation was drawn from these kinds of random walks. One where A was equal to almost 1, highly correlated. The perturbation on one trial was highly correlated to the previous trial. One where it was zero, there was no correlation between the current perturbation and the last perturbation, and one where it was negative one. If you got perturbed to the right, you're very likely to get perturbed to the left on the next trial. So what he saw was that in this condition, the k, how much people learn from error, went like this. So when a is equal to minus 0.9, a is equal to zero, a is equal to plus 0.9, what he saw was that first of all, k never became negative. People could not make their learning opposite to what one would, would one, uh, you know, uh, to the opposite of the error. But what they did is that they learned less, a little bit more, a little bit more here. So this was learning from error. How much they changed their belief on one trial versus from the error that they had learned to the next trial. So this was the first indication that one could alter their learning rate based on the dynamics of the perturbation. Yeah? Do you have uh, like a real world example where A would be negative? Um, it, it, so um, I'm going to give you examples from hidden Markov models where there's a state in the environment and the probability of staying in that environment versus changing to another state. So I don't know if there's a, it would be a flip-flop basically, right? It would be a system that, that has two states and if it's in the current state, it's very likely for it to change versus one that's likely to stay, okay? So where we're going with today's lecture is a way to understand how in principle a system could change its learning rate. So that if indeed the world is like that, it would become negative. So how does this? So this is David's work. This is work that he's done in the last year. And we're going to come up with an algorithm. And what's cool about this algorithm is that it's going to be able to help us understand a number of problems that exist in learning theory from the perspective of how we remember to do things and, and why is it that with the second time we do a task, we're better at it and so forth. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about those things more when, when we talk about uh, uh, problems like this in the next lecture. But today it's just going to be the basic algorithm. Where does it come from? And recently we discovered that this basic algorithm that I'm going to tell you about was something that was described with regard to the systems that were used to learn from error in neural networks in the early 90s. And we're going to see that the basic rule is very similar to that, but it has this, this interesting property that it, has, it is associated with errors themselves. So the basic idea in David's algorithm is that if you look at the way we've been doing things, this k here is independent of error. So the gain, how much I'm going to learn from error, is unrelated to the error itself. It's a modulator of error. So what this means is that in the common filter approach, if your gain has been increased, it's increased for all errors. Right? So we can make you a better learner in the world of the common gain independent of any error that you might see. 
So we're going to see evidence that that is not true. That when you are a better learner, you're a better learner for a specific kinds of errors. You just aren't going to become a better learner for all errors, only certain kinds of errors. And the question is why? What's so special about those errors? OK, so the point, let me go over this again. In the mathematics that we've described so far, k is a modulator. It says that I'm going to learn more or learn less from error, which depends on my uncertainty. But it does not depend on the error itself. It doesn't say, for these errors, I'm going to learn more. For these errors, I'm going to learn less. It's going to do it for everything. <coughs> OK. So, I have a question. yeah. Isn't that not inherently true, though? Because your current state uncertainty does depend on your previous history of errors. Yes, absolutely. No, it doesn't depend on previous history of errors. It depends on history of trials. It depends on the x's that you saw, not, not errors. p doesn't depend on y, right? p depends on the last p. Right, OK, yeah. k depends on y. You know, k depends on this noise in the. Oh, okay, no, that is true. Yeah, the p, the state noise doesn't actually depend explicitly on. Yeah, error. it actually in these linear models it makes no difference what errors happened. Right. So okay, let me show you, let me show you why this um, the, the the thinking began to change. So David began doing experiments were as follows. So he said, suppose we are living in a world in which there can be two kinds of perturbation. Suppose there's a minus one perturbation and there's a plus one perturbation. And there's a probability associated with staying in this state or changing. So z is my probability of staying in a plus one perturbation. So that means that if I'm in a perturbation state plus one, there's some probability that it's going to continue. But there's also some probability that it's going to change. So for example, suppose that my z is 0.9. What does that mean? That means that if I'm going to draw for you now pro, uh, pro, uh, the state of the perturbation, let me call r. r is equal to plus or minus 1. That's the perturbation. You know, if z is equal to 0.9, if I'm going to say I'm going to start at minus 1, I'm likely to stay. Then I'm going to switch, stay, switch, stay, so forth. On the other hand, if I have a scenario where z is equal to a small number like 0.1, then what's going to happen is that, so I'm going to put now z is equal to 0.1. That means that if I'm at plus 1, I'm very likely to change. So now it's going to look like this. I'm not going to stay very long. So forth. Does that make sense? OK, now, now, now what should the learner do? Learner makes a prediction on a particular trial. That prediction is associated with the actions that he does, as well as this perturbation. So if the world is stable, meaning that if z is close to 0.9, then what I l learn is going to help me for the next trial. It's good because the world is the same. Right? But if the world is going to change, what I learn is going to actually hurt me. So in the case where z is equal to 0.1, you know, I should stop learning. In the case where z is equal to 0.9, I should increase my learning. And the z is equal to 0.5, it's my neutral state. So what David did is that he you know, put people in these kinds of experiments and he measured learning from error. So of course, what you have to do is to now regulate error, because these are perturbations. These are not errors. Per per perturbations are things that are added to actions to produce error. Error is the difference between y and y hat. That's what we call error. So learning from error look like this. If you take trials, so say this is 500 trials, and you look at how people learn from error, what happens is that they, they, ha they start out by s learning by some amount. People that have z is equal to 0.9 start learning more from error. People that have z is equal to 0.1, they start learning less from error. And people that have z is equal to 0.5, they live in an environment in which the probability of staying is about the same as the probability of changing. They don't change how much they learn from error. 
So learning from error could be modulated by this probability associated with the state of the environment. Uh, are those rather uh, I think that if uh, we know that uh, our world will change definitely, then we must learn from what we predict. And like if we predict something and we are wrong, then if we know that the world will change, we predict again and it's correct. So the maximum certainty should be when uh, the world might or might not change the fickle probability, right? So what I say is that if we know that the world will uh, remain the same, yeah. then we learn a lot. Yes, if because it's going to help me the next time. If we know for sure that the world will change, mm -hmm. then I should. We should also learn a lot. But in the opposite direction. Yes. yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. So that's exactly right. So what you're saying is that in this world, when at z is equal to point 0.1, this really should continue on down here, not go to zero. But it should become negative. Yeah, it depends on how you model it. Yeah. It yeah. Yeah, right, right. We're going to get there. We'll get there. Yeah, nobody's ever shown that, but that would be, that would be reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second experiment that David did was that, all right, this is different people. So there are some people that are in this group that can increase their learning from error. There's some people in this group which can decrease their learning from error. So can the same person do both? And what he did is that he did an experiment where we began with z is equal to 0.9, then z changed to 0.5, and then z changed to 0.1. And then there was another group that started at z is equal to 0.1, went to 0.5, and then went to 0.9. And then he's measured, again, this is trial number and this is learning from error. And what he saw is that this group, you know, starts out high like this, comes down like this. This group starts down like this and goes up like that. Okay? So people seem to be changing how much they learn from error depending on the state in which the world is changing. If the world is changing based on this Markov model that says I'm likely to stay, then it makes it so that they upregulate their error sensitivity. And then when, they down, when, when the world is changing, such that one time you get one perturbation, next time you get the opposite perturbation, it makes it so that the uh, learning from error seems to go down. So what was interesting about this result is that when he looked at the amount of learning that was taking place as a function of error, so learning from error as a function of error. So error is zero here, positive here, negative here, big positive errors, big negative errors. He could test between two important hypotheses. Is it the case that in this world I am a better learner for all errors or is it some errors that I'm particularly good at? And is it in this world that I'm a poor learner for all errors, or is it, again, some errors? And what he saw was a function that looked like this. So it seemed like over some range, the errors had resulted in a modulation of the sensitivity. So for these range of errors, there was this upregulation or downregulation of this uh, sensitivity to error, whereas for these range, for these larger errors, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of change. So it wasn't the case that people were changing their sensitivity for all errors. They seemed to be changing it for some specific errors. And it certainly wasn't clear you know, why was it those errors? It turns out that those errors were the most likely errors. Yeah? Is that measured using, like, the generalization function? Ah, well, this, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. 
Right, right. So what's, what, what is that about? Yeah. It just turned out that those errors were the most likely errors. So if you look at the probability of error, it had a peak here. This is probability of error. So it just happens to be these were the errors that they actually experienced the most. And they modulated the error sensitivity for those errors in particular. OK. So then he came up with an algorithm. He said, what we want to know is, that, is there a principled way by which we should change how much we're willing to learn from error? And here's what he said. So suppose that we have a very simple learning rule where we say we're going to have a state estimator, x. And our state estimate, x hat, of n plus 1 is going to be equal to um, x hat of n plus you know, what we call our learning rate, eta, like you've seen before. And we're going to imagine that this eta depends on error times y minus y hat of n, where e of n is equal to y of n minus y hat of n. And what we want to know is that is there a principle? This is a function now. This is a function. Not, this is not multiplied by, eight, by e. So I want to know, is there a way for me to change my sensitivity to error, this eta function, as a function of this, this thing here. And how should I do it? And, and the, the thought was as follows. So suppose that you are behaving as follows. So suppose that on trial n minus 1, I generate a command u. It produces some consequence here. And here's my target here. So this is my error. Now in trial n, the next trial, I make a better u, like this, I get a little bit closer. So now what I have is that the sine of e of n minus 1 times e of n is a positive number. If that's the case, then what I should do is that I generate an action I generate another action, and I got a little bit closer. So if I were to look at what happened in my errors, these two errors had the same sign. This world is stable. I should upregulate my sensitivity to error. On the other hand, so I should increase my, my eta here. If I had a scenario where I generated a command, I got x, here's what I, what I should have done. And now I generate another command, and I get a different kind of an error. So here, the signs switch. This wasn't good. My world changed on this trial. So I should downregulate my error. So the algorithm goes as follows. Suppose that you represent eta as a function of your error as follows. There's some set of weights where it encodes error. So suppose that there is a mechanism by which your nervous system encodes errors. So this is a basis set that's going to encode error. There's a basis set for small that prefers small errors, and there's a basis set that prefers larger. Basically, it's encoding of the error space. Am I getting a small error, or am I getting a large error? And what is this GI? GI of E of n is equal to um, some exponential, to basically a Gaussian centered on some location E of i. So this is preferred error size. It just basically says, I want to encode my error. I, have one, I want an encoding of this error. I, if I get an error here, it's going to activate a basis set. And if it's going to get an error that's larger, it's going to activate a different uh, basis function. Now, the algorithm for changing eta goes as follows. So these weights are going to change as follows. W 
the set of weights that describe this error is going to be plus sine of e of n, e of n minus 1. So this is my error now. This is, this is the rule that I'm going to use to change my sensitivity to error times g of e of n minus 1 divided by g of e of n minus 1 transpose So what this means, let me give you intuition about what this means. So suppose that I'm going to plot for you now learning from error as a function of error. And suppose that I begin with just some sensitivity that says I'm equally sensitive to large errors and small errors. So what this says is that if I have an error that's negative, uh, it, if I have an error that's positive, I'm going to learn from it, move in the other direction. If I have an error that's negative, I'm going to learn from it and move in this direction. So I'm going to learn from error. And in this case, this learning from error is uniform. I'm going to learn the same from every error. Now suppose I get an error here, e of n minus 1. If the next trial has the same sign of an error, this is positive. What this means is going to increase the weight, which means that I'm going to do this going to learn a little bit more on the next trial. You see, it increased my learning at this location. If I saw an error, and I saw that error again, if e of n minus 1 and e of, e, e of n are of the same sign, they're in the same direction, what this algorithm does is that it increases the sensitivity at this particular location. If, on the other hand, the two errors were on the opposite sign, then this is what it's going to do. It's going to reduce the sensitivity. Yeah? So the vertical label learned from error, that's your error up there? The sensitivity? Okay. Right. How much do I change my estimate on the next trial, given that I saw this error in the previous trial? So this is a local rule. All you need to know is what happened in the last error and the current error. Were they of the same sign? If they are, then you should increase your error sensitivity at the particular error that you saw. If they're an the opposite sign, then should, you should reduce your sensitivity. And this rule reproduces these kinds of behaviors. But it makes a nice prediction, and the prediction is as follows. It says that if I change my sensitivity to error, I will have done so for a particular error size. I will not be a better learner everywhere. I will be just better for those errors that I saw. And here's the test of that prediction. So here's the idea. So the experiment that David did was as follows. So he said, suppose that I give you perturbations that look like this. So first I give you a perturbation that, say, goes to plus 8. And then I measure your response to a minus 4. And so here's trial number. So I, you move, I give you a plus 8 perturbation, I notice how much you learn from it, and then sometime later I give you a minus 4 perturbation, and I notice how much you learn from it. And that's your baseline. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you reduce your sensitivity for plus 8 errors and increase simultaneously your sensitivity to a minus 4 error. So the idea is, can I make it so that for one kind of an error, you're going to learn a lot from it, but for a different kind of an error, you're going to learn nothing from it. Can I make you so that for certain errors, you become very sensitive, you learn very much from it. But for other errors, you become so that you, you, you will refuse to learn from it. 
So, because you know, that's the prediction of this model. This model says that I represent my error space using a basis set. I'm sensitive to specific errors. So, the experiment goes as follows. Measure the sensitivity to a plus 8 perturbation, and then also measure it to a minus 4 perturbation. Now, I'm going to make you so that you reduce your sensitivity to plus 8 errors. How am I going to make you so that you make you reduce your sensitivity to plus 8 errors? How am I going to do that? I, I, so now what I should do is give you that environment. Right? Plus 8, minus 8, so they're switching back and forth. If, that, if I make your z equal to 0.1 in that world, you should say, oh, these errors, when I see a plus 8, I'm very likely on the next trial I'm going to see a minus 8. Why the hell should I learn from that? Right? So what he does is that he does this. Does this make sense? So now, a plus 8, minus 8, plus 8, minus 8, it gives me a scenario where error has a plus value in one side, one trial. It has a negative value in the opposite trial. I should reduce my sensitivity because the sign is going to be negative. But it's going to be negative for that particular error size, plus and minus 8. Next, what he does is that he now gives you these perturbations. Look what happens here. So now, when you get a plus 4 perturbation, you're going to have an error, and it's going to be sustained. So you're going you know, to learn these things. This is giving you errors that are sustaining. It's coming from an environment in which z is almost 1. It is 1. It's staying. But those errors are half the size of these errors. So for plus and minus 8, I should reduce my sensitivity. For plus, here's a plus 4 error. Here's a minus 4 error. I should increase my sensitivity. Simultaneously, I should increase my sensitivity to plus and minus 4 errors and reduce my sensitivity to plus and minus 8 errors. So how do we do that? We test for that again here. We again give you. these two perturbations. And what you should see is that here, I'm going to learn a lot from this, because I've seen these errors before, and they were stable. Here, I should ignore that, because it's going to go away. That's what happens. People e simultaneously increase their sensitivity for plus and minus 4 errors, decrease their sensitivity for plus and minus 8 errors which comes, we think, from something like this. All it needs is the history of the errors. And it says, when the history of the errors suggests that the environment is stable, I'm willing to upregulate my sensitivity for those errors. And if the history of errors suggests that the environment is transient, I'm going to downregulate my sensitivity for those errors. OK. What's their homework, David? OK. One trial or many trials? Many trials. Many trials. OK. OK, so you're going to get a chance to try the algorithm and see if it works for you. Um, I, if, it's, if, it's, if it'll help you guys, we can send you the paper so you can see it in, um, in detail, because you don't have any text to read this on. Um, I don't know. It's up to you, David, if you want to send it to them. Yeah, yeah. Don't submit it. All right, guys. See you Wednesday.